Hi everyone, welcome to the new setup. This is what I'm going to go with. It's taken quite some time to go through camera settings, uh, the different cameras I've tried, uh, the lighting, everything about it. I have one big main light behind the camera and everything we're going to use here to do our videos, whether it be digitally over there or traditional over here. Now, everything is going to seamlessly work together in the editing room, but what we're going to do right now is talk about pen and ink. We're going to do a little bit of pen and ink, black and white, for this first demo. This will be the first one that I'm going to put together. Uh, th this one will both be digital and traditional. What we're going to do is start off first with uh, the digital and just go over how some of the different pens may act, and I could show you real accurately in a digital way as to what to expect, whether it be a little bit more mechanical or whether it might have a little bit more character to it. Now, we're also going to go over photographs and references and or what your subject matter would be. That would be very important, only because now we have to think black and white. So only shapes are important. Now, if you could establish maybe, say, roughly five different values of black to white, then that would be good enough to get you started. If this is something you never did before, it is a lot different than color, only because we have to see things in black and white. So the more contrast we have in an image, the better off we'll be. When I used to photograph seniors and weddings, a lot of times the folks would ask me to put them in front of a nice green tree line with their burgundy blue or, or red dresses. And unfortunately, all of those colors together up against green would come out as just a medium gob of gray. I often told them that I, I will shoot color also just to give them a backup because the black and white may not come out as they thought it would. In full color, all these colors look great, but in black and white, you need contrast, whether it be a bright sunny day or colors that are very different in value. Now, we're going to go over a lot of things here in, in how to create our lines, our patterns, create different values of the black and white and we will do it both digitally to get started and then traditional uh, as a final piece. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, let's move into the photographs. Now, this is going to be coming from a photographer's standpoint of view because when you photograph black and white photography, it's roughly the same thing. You have to see in shapes and not colors. Black and white photography is going to be roughly the same as black and white pen and ink. But we'll go over the techniques to do the pen and ink, but first we have to figure out what kind of subject matter we could do. And that is very important to have a successful black and white pen and ink. For example, this photograph, the yellow leaf jumps out at you really nice. No doubt about what the subject is here. But watch what happens if I turn it into a black and white. Now the yellow leaf is completely lost and the contrast of the yellow leaf up against the lichen is just about identical. And now the leaf itself would be hard to portray as a subject in this particular photograph. Now maybe if that was a red leaf, it would uh, be much darker uh, towards black and that would be again back to maybe a decent subject of what we're working at. Now keep in mind, any of these photographs may not be considered ideal subject matter or something you want to want to actually do in a pen and ink, but what we're trying to do is actually go over photographs and colors of what to expect if you would try to do it. Here is the same thing. This orchid I photographed, a medium value purple, but this is what I was getting at with medium value purples up against green. If I turn this into a black and white, this is what I get something very different and something that may be tough or difficult to portray as a subject matter. If we start establishing our different values of gray, then we're very close to the background, trying to give it contrast that it needs to be a subject. The next one, this one is a little interesting. Now, photographically speaking, I photographed a real slow shutter speed to just give the leaves uh, in a windy day a lot of motion. And it just gave the photograph motion. But what was happening is since the tree branches were not moving at all in the wind, then they remained real sharp. Only the leaves were moving. But now if I wanted to portray that in black and white, 
it may just get confusing and you may not know what's going on or it may just look like an out of focus photograph and or drawing. Again, the subject matter and how you portray your shapes and values are going to be very important before you even start drawing. Here's the next one. Now this one is a rather dramatic change. Again, the flower jumps out at you, but now up against the green background, if I turn this into a black and white, this is what we get. Again, the same thing. All the values are the same. This is why I always brought it up to the brides that if they wanted black and white photographs, they may not come out as they expected them to. This one is the same thing up against a brick wall. A uh, setup such as this, I would maybe change the background or even just leave it go white. If I turn this one into black and white, now again the purple flowers are coming into the same value as that brick wall. If we made the background uh, completely white or even just have the flowers alone on somewhat of a stand or, or table or what have you, then that might uh, solve our problem of the flowers too close to the background of the brick wall. Now this one is interesting. I just brought this one up because the dark building, uh, the leaves jump out at you. Now in color, all the yellow leaves jump out at you. But if I turn this one into black and white, now I'm starting to lose these leaves up against the lighter colored building in direct sun, but these are all still okay up against the dark building. So again, if I start making these trees uh, different just to show dark against light here, then they may not look like the same trees over here. But again, that would be the artistic license and that would be up to you. Now the last one is we're going to take into Rebel 6 Pro and we're going to do a little bit of experimenting with it. I have a black and white photograph of it also. But what we're going to do is this one is fairly close in contrast to even though it's a bright sunny day, there really isn't too many different values of grays involved in this. If you could find five real strong distinct values of gray, then it's something to at least start with. Now obviously it doesn't have to be five. As far as different values of gray, the stronger your black and white pen and ink will be. Let's take this image into Rebel 6 Pro and go from there. Okay, here's our photograph. It's a full color photograph, but I'm going to show you a couple of things. If you want to do a black and white pen and ink, or even any type of black and white study, then what we could do is go up to Window, hit our reference image right here, which is this right here, and our reference image, wherever it is on your system, all you have to do is hit Upload right here, and here they are right here, and then pull in whatever photograph you want to work from, when you click on it once, it'll come up in your reference palette. And then what you could do then is just hit this middle button right here, grayscale, and it'll turn your reference into a black and white. So then you only have black and white values to work from. Now, if you want to do things a little different and even help yourself out a little more, just to experiment, then what we could do is go to uh, view and then just hit grayscale G and then that will turn your photograph into a black and white and then you could save it and then close out and then bring it up again as a black and white. But I'll show you why we could do that if you need to. Okay, I brought up the black and white photograph, but this is the reason why we could do this. And that is if I hit view, I'm no longer viewing it as a grayscale. So it is just a black and white photograph in color mode, but I'm doing this uh, just to show you something, and that is if we go down to the color sets and hit our hamburger down here, and then just go to create color sets, let's just even go with 16 colors, and what it'll do is give us a value of this particular picture. I just went in and brought up the exact same picture, wherever it was, and this is the gray, black to white gray scale it gave me. Now, what I could do with this now, and I, I left this up and I'll be able to use color for this. If I go to just black and select that, and then I have my opacity 100%, so I wanna duplicate these values as, as much as I can. I'm gonna go over here and put 
my black right here and then I'm going to try and pull out another color just say this one right here that's different enough from the black we'll put it right here and then let's go to a few over let's go to uh, just say this one right here we'll put that one down right there and then we will go to this one here put that one down right here and then put this white one that is the whitest of the whites and we'll put that one right there now we have five different values from white to black that are somewhat different and if we could duplicate these five values in our pen and ink drawing then we could establish different shapes uh, different objects uh, pretty reliably and now what I mean by that is if we need some help figuring out what values these are then all we have to do is use our magic wand and let it do it for us if we select our magic wand I don't want a tolerance more than 10 because we don't want to be picking out too many neighboring pixels and I'll leave the contiguous off because then it'll pick up that value anywhere it is so if I click on black because I put all five of these samples on the same layer as my image I could just click on it and wherever that color is it's going to pick it out for me okay let's go through all five values we'll establish a new color for each one and that will show us where those particular values are throughout the photograph okay all I'm doing is actually establishing each separate layer for each color I have to make sure I go back to the original photograph layer before I select and then go to the individual layer to fill it with its own color okay now we got all of our different color values blocked in with its own color and that will give us a good idea to see where each one of those values of gray are throughout our photograph this would help you isolate shapes and different values because in other words if you have different colors in your photograph but are the same value then you would have to make the corporate decision of how you would actually separate those two objects otherwise they may start to run together and look confusing this is all water in the background other than uh, the kayak and the kayaker himself but then you could see that we have some blues in the water but then also some blues in the kayak so if you use that same value of gray throughout the water and the kayak then that's when things might get a little bit confusing now the red again there's hardly any uh, just pure black if I turn these off we will see back to our black and white photograph if I want to see where just the black is that would be then just the red and then now this uh, darker gray that was the orange now you can see then how it's, it's starting to shape up as to what it's going on but again then if I use this medium value gray which is the yellow then that is also within the kayak and also the water so again if you start using the same values of grays for different objects that's when things could be confusing there's our white which is just the green uh, very little pure white at all so uh, we would be doing a lot of inking this would be a pretty tough picture to do in black and white uh, just because of the intensity uh, but we will go over some things and start with some objects and uh, just rough sketches that would be a little bit more easier to start with let's take a look and see what kind of pen strokes we could make and then go on to a, a, a small digital pen and ink study okay let's get started I have a few things here laid out we have quite a bit to do here uh, with a cube sphere and then I'm going to do a finished piece over here on the right hand side uh, it'll be an arch but now keep in mind when we're doing pen and ink what we're really actually doing is just taking a black line up against white paper and trying to create values with that now what we're doing is actually creating an optical mix how close we put the lines together how many times we overlap them will create a, a gray value optical mix now depending on how we put our lines we may start to create linear or circular textural patterns uh, different things that we may want 
that will try to separate objects and or parts of our subject of what we're trying to do. Now here, just in this sense right here, uh, these lines are with two different pens. This one is the bullet pen right here, and that's what th these lines are. And then this is the fountain pen, which is what I made these lines were. Now what I did was, just to keep it on the scientific side, I just took this exact same set of lines and duplicated them down here, and then took this exact set of lines and duplicated them down here. Now what I wanted to do this for was because the tech pens kind of end in just a very uh, half circle line with very little to no taper at all. Again, that would depend on how you have your uh, pen ink tips adjusted. But what will happen is because there's no taper, when you start overlapping your lines right in here might give you a much darker value than you want because you're having a lot more line overlapping. So it's going to give you a illusion of a darker area right here versus the fountain tip pen because these taper a lot more uh, with the fountain tip. And then what we'll do is where they overlap, you may have more of a subtle transition between different patches of lines that you're trying to stitch together and cross hatch. So just to keep that in mind, that is one of the more obvious setups you'll get uh, as far as depending on what pen tip you use. And for the most part, if you want to just start working with the default, uh, that's just those two. Now what I have is and my bullet. This is how my settings are with the stroke. I have a zero pen pressure. So in other words, I'll get a real round edge. And then the shapes, I just have a white and a pure circle. And that's it. That will give me a very straight technical line probably equivalent to a roller ball pen or even just uh, the felt tip uh, drawing pens that, uh, that are always considered the waterproof ink in traditional. Now the uh, fountain pen, it's the same thing. It is uh, set, the shape and grain is just a circle and then same thing, I have just a, a white square so I just get a circle and that's it. But my stroke is quite different in the sense that now I have pen pressure 100%. So that stroke, if I take this down, then I'll start to get more of the rounded edge like the uh, actual bullet pen. But if I take this all the way up to 100, then I'm going to get a very sharp point at the beginning and the end of my stroke. And this is usually what I really like using old-fashioned fountain pens that I would call them. Uh, that would give me a very specific line that has a little wee bit more uh, character to it uh, versus the uh, traditional mechanical drafting looking lines of, of a, a tech pen or a rollerball pen. Those I'll all be going over also in the traditional side of this uh, demonstration, but it may be a part two though also. Now here's what I want to go over next. These two squares one, I'm going to draw in the square, and the other one, I'm just going to use the square as a guide, and then we'll turn it off. And the reason why I'm going to be doing this is, uh, we'll just do this in speed, uh, but what I want to just show you is, be careful outlining your shapes. When you draw something out, you may want to start outlining everything right away before you start uh, shading it in, but that may be a mistake because your lines might become more dominant than what your shape is. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, I'll show you the difference here once we're done. And then also, if you want to just get started, I'm going to use the polygon uh, selection tool for this that I can really select off my areas because if I want to shade an area within the specific shape, that is a very good way of keeping all your lines within your selected area shape. Let's go ahead and speed these in. Okay, let's take a look and see what we have. Uh, I just made two squares here side by side. 
And what I want to show you is just be careful not to outline everything you want to do uh, when you first start. Uh, you may want to create your edges and lines with your cross hatching or whatever stipple effect dots patterns we're going to go over through some of those that will just create your shapes but you may want to leave those create your edges and not outline everything because otherwise if i have a dark black line up here that's okay the line is kind of camouflaged with all the dark line work but then i may also not want a perfect straight edge now if it's a block or box and it needs a straight edge that's fine but if it's uh, something of a piece of stone or something like that that might have a subtle irregular edge, then you may want to incorporate that versus a perfect straight line. So now what I'm getting at is sometimes it would be better to just leave your cross hatching, determine your edges versus outlining everything. Because now down here, this would be more of a compositional element. But now that I have a nice lighter value down here, I can't make that transition from this lighter value to the white of the paper. Where this one over here, if I go ahead and turn off my square drawing, then now I actually have a nice transition from the lighter area of this square into the white of the paper. You see a nice illusion of a square, but there's no lines to stop you from moving from the paper to the lighter area of the square or uh, the other way around taking the uh, square going back into the white paper. Uh, that creates a nice three-dimensional movement. And again, we're doing all of this uh, just with black lines on white paper. Uh, but first, I want to go over some photographs just to show you if the light is somewhat behind the cube and or box, then the darker areas are going to be on the bottom and the lighter areas on top. And then this corner up in here will be shadowed. And this corner will be shadowed a little bit darker here. Here's the black and white version. And then now we can see a little bit easier where our lighter and darker areas are. The cellophane tape is reflecting quite a bit. Uh, but now moving on. Now here is uh, the light towards more towards the front. Uh, because the shadow is going straight off the edge of the base. So the light is kind of like right alongside the front edge. And then the paper is reflecting up into it. So now the top of this plane is darker than the bottom. And then this side is still a little bit darker right here. And then this side right here is darker right here. And uh, that we could show in the uh, gray version. And then now here's our sphere. Because I wanted to choose a light bulb because it's translucent. And we're going to have a nice glow around the inside. But then notice how the sphere itself on the bottom is, is shadowed. But then it's up against a lighter area uh, because it's allowing light to pass through it. Uh, that's giving it an effect. And being that it's a highly reflective surface, it's going to reflect my desk lamp perfectly. And then this line right in here is actually the white of the paper being reflected up into the spherical shape of the light. There's the black and white version. Now here's a sphere of stainless steel polished next to the light bulb. They're both highly reflective. Here you can see the white of the paper much easier, how it's reflecting the whole entire table of the white. Uh, now this light down in here is being reflected off the light bulb. Uh, this is the light being passed through the glass, which is a little bit different. This is translucent light. This is reflected light. So you have two different things going on there. That's just the tape I use to keep that stainless ball bearing in place. It's a big one, about two inches solid. Uh, and then this is the black and white version. You can even see uh, my phone and my hands that I use to take the picture with. And then also uh, we'll move on to now a third sphere, which here's the difference. These are highly reflective. This one is not. So you can see the difference in the highlighted areas. Uh, versus this one the highlight is a perfect reflection where here this one is a, a far more diffused highlight area and because they're still sitting on white paper uh, we're getting some nice reflective light up in to the bottoms of the spheres uh, especially this one because it's it's a, a rather non-reflective object so it's absorbing the light where these are reflecting it off and you can see the difference of the bottoms here compared to this one here uh, is quite different. 
There's the black and white version. And then moving on to now, it's sitting on a black base. Uh, this would be over-exaggerating the opposite direction. But now, because it's a glossy black surface, I'm even getting a reflection of the light bulb right here, which is white. But then now, these are just real dark shadowed areas. Uh, this right here is the white of the edge of the paper. Uh, it still has the nice, a big, giant glow of a highlight area, the softball. And then the same thing with the uh, spherical stainless steel ball and the, the light bulb. Uh, there's a lot of reflection going on uh, within these two objects here. There's the black and white version. And now the last one is interesting. I put it on black velour. Photographically speaking, this is the light killer. Uh, it just does not reflect light at all. And I left this little wee bit up in here just to show you uh, that it, it really absorbs light. And you can see what it's doing to our uh, bottoms of our spheres as far as uh, how there's no light whatsoever reflecting. Uh, this white through the light bulb is pretty much light going through it and not reflecting up. And then you can even see how the the perfect mirror stainless steel ball is just reflecting the black off and its base is completely gone and then uh, the even the softball it's it's rather difficult to pick up the base of the uh, softball itself where the the whole tire tops are lit up uh, but definitely no reflected light off of the uh, velour and then uh, that's it there's the black and white version and we will move into drawing our cubes uh, this was just a quick uh, proof, so to speak, of how we are going to shade our cube and our sphere. Let's get started on our cube. Okay, let's go ahead and start our cube. But what we're going to do instead of just a plain cube, uh, we'll actually do the uh, box itself. And we'll even try and duplicate that cellophane tape. It is very subtle, but we're going to try and do it anyway. And just to give a rendering of a box to see if we can make it look like a cardboard box. Okay, we just have a uh, basic box roughed in. Uh, there's some things I could do to it uh, to make it a little bit more realistic and that's what we're going to try to do here but what I want to let you know though is actually the uh, different uh, line work we could use keep in mind this is digital so what I mean by that is if you want to draw your box or whatever object you're drawing you could even keep each plane on its own layer then that way when you go back and maybe do these lines right here and if you think it's a little wee bit irregular and a little wee bit soft you could go ahead and, and draw it in with the polygon tool make this a perfect straight edge but if it's on its own separate layer then you could even take an eraser and just destroy that edge a little bit uh, so it, it's just not perfectly straight anymore or just soften it up a little bit however you feel you want to duplicate and or render the object you're doing. Again, if you want to help yourself out, if you keep these things on separate layers and you could go back and uh, rearrange them or adjust them as you need to, and you're not going to uh, hurt or destroy or affect any other part of the box itself. Now what I'm going to do is I'll use the polygon for this one just to show you how. And when we do the tape, Sometimes if there's a different break in your line pattern, that will designate a different object that's involved in your subject. So in other words, if we draw the lines one way with, with a box, but then change up that pattern where the cellophane starts, then that may help uh, just denote something different there other than taking those same lines across the tape and then just making the tape darker. That could work, but that might look like a stripe. But if it looks like something separate than the box, then at least you're on your way. Let's go ahead and get started on this box. Again, using the polygon tool will help you 
create uh, the beginning and ends of each line well within the area you're working in. It's a great way to establish edges just by your cross hatching. Working on the cellophane tape and the rest of the box, I'm just trying to bring things all together. What I want to do is treat this just like traditional watercolors. What I want to do is always be able to go darker, but it's very difficult to lighten up certain areas. There is white inks, different things like that, but what happens is it is very noticeable and it may build up a little bit because it has to be a thick color opaque white to be able to cover back over the black ink. And sometimes it is just a, a much more improved drawing if you could get it right the first time without trying to go back over it and redoing it. Now that's traditional, of course. Digital, you'll have plenty of options to revise or change things or get a second chance at doing it right the second time. Okay, let's see what we got here. Uh, the actual reference is showing our tape a little wee bit darker and a nicer transition. So what I'll do is I'll take this right in here and here and make it a little bit more of a better gradation out to about what's right out here and here. So I'll just slowly darken this area up uh, till it feathers from this to this. Let's do that now and then I think our box will be pretty well done. Let's go ahead and finish it up. Okay, we pretty well got our box uh, roughed in. Uh, just to show you, since this is digital, uh, this corner right here is just coming out a little wee bit too much. We could go up to here and hit Edit, hit our Warp tool, right here under Transform, Warp, and then what we could do is add one more point, about right there, and then we're going to take these in just a little bit. And then this one out. And if I give my box a little wee bit character, that would be okay too. And then take this one down. Take this one down. Take this one straight in. And let's get one more. Put it right there. And then that would be it. Now let's try that and see what that looks like. That's a little bit better. But it won't affect our lines too much the way for all that we adjusted it. But then uh, for this part and this box going by this reference up here in our reference panel, I would consider it pretty well blocked in and done. We made the individual flaps from the top and the bottom and then we put the tape in. And again, if we change up the angles of the lines, then you could introduce a new object uh, and or surface uh, that is a part of that box just to make it look like something else and that's a pretty big challenge I would normally not do something like this in black and white only because the tape is so close to the value of the box Now let's go on to our sphere and we'll uh, take it from there Okay, let's get started on our sphere and what I was originally going to do is just a regular sphere uh, With the shadow and all that is is just a, an ellipse uh, that's a layer right below the circle. So it looks like the shadow already. Uh, but what we can do instead is let's just go back to our references. I'll turn these off. And we're going to turn this on. And that is just our basic softball. Since we already used it as a photo reference to go from, I thought it would be better to do this just so we could try and duplicate a reflected light and everything. We'll just readjust it. Uh, considering it's not there and then we'll also readjust the shadow and we'll eliminate this lightness that's being reflected off of the uh, stainless uh, then what we'll do is try and do this and see if we could duplicate it and the reason why is everything has been lines up until now but now we're going to do uh, just real fine squigglies uh, to try to do the uh, texture that's on the cover itself I think that's the technical term, squigglies, but let's go ahead and give this guy a shot. I'm not going to do the softball with any type of a selection tool. 
Keep in mind you could use the freehand selection tool uh, with this type of a drawing. Then that way you could create unusual shapes in selected areas. And then also use the uh, selection plus to add different shapes. If you have to use different shapes in different areas at the same time, then you could draw your lines unobstructed from one selected area to another. What I'm trying to do right now is just isolate my darkest shapes and darkest values. This way I'll know that anywhere else on the object I cannot go any darker. If I start working with medium values but then make them too dark, then I won't have enough room to take the dark areas of the subject or object dark enough. They will already be too dark with my medium values. Let's take a look and see what we have. Okay, let's see what we have here. Uh, right now, it's, it's pretty well done. Uh, looking at this, I think this light in here is coming from the stainless steel ball bearing. And this light right in here, I might have went too dark. And just to show you a fix up with digital, uh, we could try and fix this up a little bit. We'll try and lighten this up just a little bit. Even if I take it all the way back to white and then feather this back in, uh, just so I blend it back in, just like I added the shadow. Uh, but we have to just be careful a little bit with our line work, uh, just so it, it stays uh, true to a shade and not develop some kind of a texture that we may not want. Let's see if we can lighten this area up right in here just a little bit, just as a fix up. Okay, that looks a little bit better. Uh, we just uh, kind of uh, just weave the lines back into what was already there and just uh, gave it a little bit of a, a lighter look to it. Uh, just because they're all just squiggly lines, there's really a, not really a specific pattern to them, uh, but this will just give you an idea of just uh, keeping a sphere looking a little bit more like a sphere. Now you can use straight lines, but then you might lose that three-dimensional spherical look. But that is up to you, depending on how you want to portray it. It could be what I would call graphic also. Now, uh, this one I would pretty much consider pretty well finished. Let's move on to the final architectural drawing, and we'll see how that one turns out. Okay, I rearranged some things here, and here is going to be our final drawing right here. We're just going to do this study. This is our softball. We'll turn it off, and that would be right here. Uh, here's our cube. We'll turn that off. And then we'll even turn off these two. We don't need them anymore. And what I will do is open up my reference. Here's the reference. And this is going to be obviously the darkest areas here. And since this is an arch with some light, just kind of scattering across it. Here's what I wanted to show you real quickly before we actually uh, started this one. And that is how the shadow is across two different walls. If I try to shade that shadow with just lines straight across, I may lose the appearance of two different walls meeting together. In other words, this corner right here. Now, obviously, I put a line in just to designate, just a soft, quick sketch line to designate the difference between the two walls where they meet. But I would not really want to make a line there unless I had some hard color changes like right here or I should say value changes. And then like this one here, uh, there's some uh, hard uh, lines going across this. It could actually either be cut marks uh, on the stone, which is like right here, or uh, even just, uh, just gradations in the uh, uh, sandstone itself. Now, what I wanna show you though, is again, uh, just shadowing the same shadow, tree shadow on the wall, but on two different walls. So what I would do is on this wall, I may take these lines down this way and then maybe cross hatch a little bit and then take these lines the opposite way and then cross hatch them just to keep the two walls separate. I think that would still portray the shadow, but I wouldn't lose the effect of my two walls at a right angle. If I make lines just straight across the entire shadow, 
then I'm going to lose that effect that it's going to look like this wall is just continuing on when it actually stops here and then should go to a right angle this way. So we'll show you how this will work together. And that is uh, just to try and vary the lines again, because that is what could make all the difference uh, in your final piece. Uh, that if you uh, run some of these together, what I'll do is maybe even some of these, I'll try and create a uh, subtle pattern in some of the stones. And then uh, even especially like this up in here at the top of the arch, uh, there's a real fine stipple effect. So I may go to a, a real fine stipple effect there uh, just to show the unevenness of the sandstone itself. But then obviously the grout joints will be the darkest. Uh, so let's go ahead and give this a start. And uh, what I wanted to show you though too is one last thing that's rather important. I'm going to close this. And right now it's 55%. If I put this on 62%, that is print size on my monitor. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to work at it at print size and just work it this way. That This is going to be right here, the arch pen and ink. And this is where I'll start. But what I will do is actually work at life size. Now, obviously, digital, uh, we can uh, make it bigger and fill in the gaps. But then you have to be careful that if you make it big and use real fine lines and then shrink it down, the thickness of your lines may start to disappear at print size because they're getting too thin uh, when you shrink it down. Uh, that's one big thing I really do with my artwork is always view it at print size. Uh, because even if you paint rather loose, you start to shrink it way down, any loose painting will start to tighten up and look more detailed as you shrink it down. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and get this arch started. And we will open this up. And I am going to work on it uh, just this size. And we'll see how it goes. I have the pen set at 15 but I'm barely touching the paper, so I am getting a much finer line than 15. But now that I'm working print size, whatever size line I get will be true to the print. In other words, I'll get what I see. Let's get this architectural drawing started. I have this pretty much set at ludicrous speed. This is about a three hour drawing, uh, speed up to about only a little over 30 seconds. What I'm actually doing now is just still blocking in my darkest areas. That is why I started down in the lower left-hand corner. I wanted to establish the very darkest part of the picture I could. And then that way I will know that I have to keep everything else much lighter than it just to be able to keep my values correct. Again, I chose different angles on each side of the wall to keep them separated. Let's take a look and see what we have. Okay, let's take a look and see what we got with our arch. Uh, the arch is pretty well done. I could have went a little wee bit darker back in here, but I kind of like to see the uh, mortar joints the way they are, that I might start losing them if I go too dark. And all that I will be doing is just slowly chopping up them little wee white bits that are left, and that's it. And then again, the angles and types of pen marks you use uh, could very well determine what you're trying to represent. It could be stone, it could be bark, it could be fur, uh, it could be flowers, a very stippled pattern. If you try to do sand, then you may want to just use nothing but dots and, and do a uh, just a real fine texture. Uh, even squigglies might not look right uh, for sand. But it is all going to depend on what texture you're trying to reproduce. That is why I wanted to show you the different photographs and just go over them. These areas up in here, just quickly, uh, this is a concave space back in here, and then this is a convex space out here. So one is coming out at you and the other one's going back in away from you. Uh, and that I tried to represent with the angles and curves of my lines, uh, just to show uh, one difference from the other. Now, the areas that are in the bright sun, I just left them pure white, even though they probably should have some type of value to them. 
But in a worst case scenario, if you leave it white, you can't go wrong to reproduce a bright sunlight area only because if you start taking a little bit too dark, then digitally, yes, you can change it. But when we do our next one in traditional, you may be in trouble. But now that one, I will work from a layout and uh, tracing paper that I draw out this way. I just uh, have been accustomed to ever since I left school uh, back in the early 80s. Uh, what I actually do is always have a backup layout on paper. So if I do by chance mess up, uh, even that includes a spill of a coffee, uh, then I could at least uh, retrace it out and get started again right away without having to freehand draw it all over again. Uh, but with this one, I think this one's pretty well done. By all means, if you have any questions about any of the uh, pen and ink work I did throughout this particular demo, please feel free to ask. I will definitely try to get back to your questions as soon as I can. And then uh, the next one will be traditional, but I may have even a watercolor or so in between. So until I see you out in the field or back at the studio, thanks for watching.